Uh, guten Morgen, and uh, very thankful for Future City Global for your kind invitation to be able to share uh, with all of you today. And I will speak uh, mostly about Singapore's continuing transformation. Um, maybe just a couple of words about uh, the Centre for Livable Cities for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, CLC was established formally by the Singapore Ministry of National Development and the Ministry of Sustainability and Environment in 2008. And this was an outcome of the Singapore Sustainability Blueprint uh, at that time. It is a knowledge centre that looks at what makes cities livable and sustainable. And we consider ourselves uh, eminent in the space of uh, policy research to support our colleagues in the built environment sector in Singapore. More recently, CLC has taken on the role of a futures centre for Singapore's urban development. And the insights we seek will be applicable, I'm sure, to many cities, especially those that are facing high-density futures. So for today's session, I'll be sharing briefly on two key areas, Singapore's early challenges and how it addressed those, and Singapore's approach to address future challenges. So by way of introduction, um, I'd like just to show you this contrast. Uh, the two pictures actually show a very similar uh, viewpoint, uh, about 60 years apart. And the low-rise and the haphazard city of the 60s uh, has actually given way to a very thriving metropolis offering a highly livable environment. And this transformation journey was enabled uh, by taking a long-term approach to planning and development, but underpinned by a continuity in leadership and good urban governance. So as an island city-state with many competing needs, Singapore's challenge from day one has always been about its land and resource constraints. But these serve as a stark reminder that we could not afford to waste anything. In fact, we recycle many things even today, including water, land, and even our incinerator bottom ash. So we just put up some of these by, by way of comparison. Um, I think uh, earlier uh, you saw the comparison between Switzerland and Singapore, but they decided to, to place uh, Zurich and, and Singapore together on the, uh, on the map. So you just have a, side, a sense of the relativity between our two uh, cities. Um, but really, you know, we, we have to fit in a lot more things uh, within our footprint uh, because we serve not just as a city for the residents, uh, but as a country. So a lot of infrastructure that would normally be sited outside the city's limits have to be accommodated within Singapore's land area. Now we plot the livability matrix, um, and this uh, plots the EIU livability score for cities against population uh, density. And Singapore is part of a fairly unique group of high density cities that that somehow score well in the EIU Global Livability Index. Now, most cities which are well regarded for livability uh, have a much lower population density than Singapore. Now, CLC distilled some of the key principles for Singapore's urban development experience since our independence in 2010 and we developed this framework for understanding the dynamics of balancing different outcomes to arrive at a livable and sustainable city. And obviously the city of today is not the city that it was in the 1960s. So we've had to be able to keep pace with the economic progress, but also the needs and the demands of, of our residents. The three livable city outcomes that were derived, are a high quality of life, a competitive economy, which really translates into jobs and investments, and a sustainable environment, which are supported by two key urban systems, the integrated master planning and development, and dynamic urban governance. So as a city-state with few natural resources, a competitive economy was crucial to be able to attract and retain businesses and foreign investments for job creation. And a comprehensive housing program formed the bedrock for a high quality of life for our residents. And with limited space, we could not afford to pollute any part of our island or to accommodate huge landfills. So since 2010, obviously a lot of things have continued to happen and disruptions like the pandemic, 
serve as a timely reminder that cities need to be prepared for future surprises brought about perhaps by climate change or some of the geopolitical contests that are unfolding uh, even as we speak. And we must be able to harness new tools to, to support good urban planning and governance. So given these experiences, CLC is in the process of renewing the livability framework to get fresh insights on how the concept of livability will continue to evolve in the future. For example, as the effects of climate change become more apparent, and I think many cities around the world probably experienced one of the hottest summers on record in the last few months. So we expect that city dwellers may, ex may demand a more significant tilt towards environmental sustainability and resilience in the years to come. So Singapore's long-term planning has always taken place over two segments, the long-term plan uh, and the master plan. The long-term plan, which was formerly known as the concept plan, is Singapore's strategic land use and infrastructure plan that guides the development of Singapore. And it maps out our strategic uses and infrastructure needs over a time frame of 50 years and beyond. The first concept plan in 1971 laid the foundation for Singapore's growth and city structure, meeting the basic needs of a young nation, developing new housing towns, industrial estates, transport infrastructure, and recreational spaces across the island. Now, we review our long-term plans for Singapore every 10 years or so, based on our changing needs and uh, long-term trends. But following the 2021 long-term plan review, where we develop long-term strategies to guide Singapore's development, we're now building on these shared conversations to map out the detailed land use plans for the next 10 to 15 years in what we call the Draft Master Plan 2025. So, um, similar to other cities, Singapore, of course, faces more uncertainties with emerging trends and complex challenges that will impact how we live, work and play and how we interact with the countries around us. So, we must not plan only for what we know now, but also to prepare for what we might know about the future, both the known unknowns and to be prepared perhaps for more unknown unknowns. Uh, we have to keep our plans flexible and adaptable to respond to changing needs and circumstances. And we recognize that perhaps there's a lot more interdependency that occurs today between countries and cities. And we have to make sure that for a land scarce city like ours, that sufficient land is safeguarded for sustainable development and a quality living environment. Now, as we plan for our future city, we also look at other trends that are emerging, such as flexible work arrangements, and these came to the fore in the last uh, few years during the pandemic. Uh, of course, we look at things like e-commerce, which is in, in a large sense changed the face of retail in the city, smart technologies, climate change effects, and of course, how to keep our city resilient and sustainable for future generations. So in the long-term plan review 2021, a year-long engagement was actually conducted. And in Singapore, we engaged over 15,000 people across all walks of life. And this was done via a combination of online polls, virtual workshops, facilitated discussions, and webinars. And it culminated in a public exhibition which presented seven pillars based on our future trends. And these are namely work, live, play, which has been there for a while, move, cherish, which really talks about the maintaining the lovability of the city, stewardship, and sustain. Now, typically, when we unveil a, a long-term plan, um, we like to be able to speak about some of the big moves that will occur in the next uh, 40, 50 years. So first of these, of course, in the recent plan was the Jurong Lake District. It was first announced in 2001 as one of three regional centres outside of the CBD as part of the URA's decentralisation strategy, occupying about 360 hectares of land. It will be developed into Singapore's largest business district outside the traditional city centre. 
And it has a goal to achieve net zero emissions for new developments by 2045, which will be five years ahead of the rest of the island. It therefore also serves as a living lab to pilot new urban solutions and to refine sustainability-centric initiatives. Secondly, the relocation of the Pileba Air Base, which is on the see, right of the, of the, uh, doc, of the uh, slide. Uh, this was actually first announced in 2013. It will actually free up about 800 hectares of land for redevelopment. I think more importantly, the relocation of the airbase actually allows building height restrictions in the neighbouring towns to be lifted and opens up the possibilities for even a higher future redevelopment. So I will just pivot now to talk a little bit about how we do intend to use the science of cities for our urban uh, uh, planning and governance. Uh, firstly, on the urban heat island effect. Singapore is increasingly drawing on the science of cities to help us better plan and adapt. And one major set of challenges that we face arises from climate change and urbanisation in the form of the urban heat island effect and rising sea levels. So as Singapore's master developer for public housing, the Housing Development Board has incorporated integrated environmental modelling since 2016 to make sure that the public housing blocks, for example, in the Tengah New Town, are able to capitalise on prevailing wind flows and to be able to channel wind through the precinct and residential spaces to aid in cooling. Secondly, the use of digital urban twins and the urban heat maps help our cities better anticipate uh, challenges, in particular to be able to simulate a range of possible outcomes as well as unintended consequences for planners to sharpen their interventions and design better. So one key initiative in Singapore that is currently underway includes the FCL Global Digital Urban Climate Twins at the Singapore ETH Centre. And we understand this project combines digital urban twin technology with urban heat maps so that city planners understand the impact of what they may introduce into future urban design. Secondly, on the rising sea levels, Singapore is a very low-lying state and we're actively trialling different coastal protection solutions, including nature-based solutions. So one of these, of course, capitalises on mangrove forests to dissipate waves and to trap sediment in our coastal areas. Now, to further research in this area, the Marine Climate Science Programme was launched to serve as a national focal point for multidisciplinary marine climate change research. And this $25 million programme places emphasis on translational research, so that we are better advised on the value of safeguarding our coastal and marine ecosystems against climate change and how to leverage our blue spaces as potential carbon sinks. And we anticipate that these uh, solutions may also prove useful and relevant to other coastal cities, many of which are in our region. On accessibility for our city of the future, Singapore is also making a shift uh, towards being much more car light. And this makes sure that residents are able to access transport systems that are easily navigated and affordable for people of all ages with different mobility levels. And by 2030, our aim is to be able to increase the walk cycle ride share of peak hour trips from about 71% today to 75% and beyond. Singapore is also currently working on the implementation of what we call car-like towns, 10 of these. And they are areas with improved public transport accessibility via trains and buses, as well as improved connectivity for greener modes of transportation, such as walking, cycling, and personal mobility. On green spaces, the pandemic, of course, has shown that cities of the future must ensure that all groups of people have good access to green space. And in Singapore, this is very much part of the social compact. Singapore currently has one of the highest densities of street greenery amongst other global cities, despite having one of the highest population densities. And in March 2020, we introduced uh, this uh, vision of being a city in nature. And my colleague Yuning, of course, is here uh, very much to lead this effort to ensure that a green, livable and sustainable home for Singaporeans uh, is assured for generations to come. 
So some of the key targets by 2030 include extending 170 kilometers of existing nature ways to 300 kilometers, enabling 100% of households to have a 10-minute walk to a public park, and to plant 1 million trees up from the stock currently of about 6 million trees. And we are about halfway through this program. Now, to ensure the resiliency of Singapore's natural heritage, the National Parks Board also conducted a national ecological profiling exercise in 2021 to understand the role of specific green sites in providing refugia and ecological connectivity for our native biodiversity. And these evidence-based efforts reflect a growing interest, of course, amongst several cities to be able to preserve natural habitats, even within a metropolitan area, so that biodiversity in the city can be supported. On smart cities, a city of the future is, of course, expected to be smart, and cities leverage on technology to become more efficient, more environmentally friendly, and more socially inclusive. So the slide uh, captures some of Singapore's existing efforts, and of course, these include things like the e-planner, which actually brings together more than 100 maps and data sets for easy access by our offices from, diff from 50 different uh, public agencies and ministries to support better planning outcomes within a whole of government. The Smart Nation Sensor Platform is an integrated nationwide digital platform that uses sensors to collect big data to create smart urban solutions that, again, can improve livability. And these include, for example, smart water sensors being installed in homes and connected wirelessly to monitor real-time water usage data and to detect leaks via a mobile app. And the One Service app, something managed by uh, my ministry, um, is a one-stop digital platform for citizens to be able to feedback on municipal issues without spending time trying to work out which agency they need to contact. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that Singapore's small size and lack of resources actually have provided an impetus to continue to seek innovative and practical solutions which can improve the sustainability of our city. And as we continue to learn and adapt best practices from other cities and countries, I hope Singapore can also serve as a, an example of how cities can address the emerging challenges as well as coping with greater population density. And it's important to be able to continue these conversations and for cities to learn from one another. So I'd also like to use this opportunity to introduce our Biennial World City Summit, which is next expected in June 2024. And it is an extensive platform for government leaders and industry experts to address livable and sustainable city challenges. I'm confident that the summit will prove highly beneficial for many of you who, if you choose to attend, given the top-level knowledge sharing and networking opportunities it affords. Thank you very much.